Hello and welcome to another episode of the World War II podcast. I'm Angus Wallace. In this episode, I'm joined by Walter Bowman. Now, if you cast your mind back, I talked to him in episode 25 about General MacArthur. That was nearly three years ago. How <laughs> time flies. But since then, Walter has been busy researching the sinking of the USS Arizona during the attack on Pearl Harbor in December of 1941 and the fate of the crew, including a remarkable 23 sets of siblings. His new book is called Brothers Down, and I thought we'd get him back to discuss it. But before we get there, I'd like to say hello to all the new patrons who have signed up to support the podcast in the last month or so. This podcast is brought to you by listeners like yourself who bask in a philanthropic, satisfying, rosy glow due to being patrons of the podcast. A dollar or so from you goes a long way toward helping me find the time to put the show together. You can find out more at patreon.com slash ww2podcast. By becoming a patron, you'll have access to uh, extras that I release. Just a little more World War II chat to keep your little grey cells stimulated. So head over to patreon.com slash ww2podcast where you can marvel at a short video of me explaining it. Right, so on to the main feature. Walter, welcome back. So we're going to be looking at the USS Arizona and the attack on Pearl Harbor in um, 1941. Shall we start with the ship? When was she laid down? What kind of ship was she? The, the Arizona is really uh, a, a cutting edge battleship that's that's laid down in, in 1913. She's launched in, in 1915. And when she's launched, she really is a major weapon. It's kind of interesting how, how battleships, as important as they were, really have a fairly short history. I mean, as far as steel battleships coming online, it's the Spanish-American War for uh, the U.S., and of course, it's the rivalry between Great Britain and Germany that sort of fuels the dreadnought campaign and those kind of capital ships coming down the ways. But Arizona is is finally launched then in, in 1915. Did she see any action in the First World War or subsequently? No. The, you know, the U.S. Navy uh, certainly does some things in, in the North Atlantic, but not in terms of larger capital ships like uh, the Arizona. The Arizona makes it to Europe twice, but actually in terms of, of ferrying troops back and forth af after the war. And actually, she participates in the uh, the fleet that kind of takes uh, Woodrow Wilson uh, to the Paris peace talks from, from England. So by, well, by the outbreak of the Second World War, she's getting... Uh, Surely, somewhat long in the tooth. Is she? Uh, I, I, I won't say antiquated. I was. Is she getting out of date uh, compared to the rest of the fleet? Well, you know, it's kind of interesting. After World War One, there, there's this Washington Naval Conference in 1923, and the major powers of the sea at that point, Great Britain. The United States and Japan uh, agree to limit uh, battleship construction and, and tonnages. And, of course, Japan later on doesn't uh, uh, go ahead and go along with that. But the United States does, and for a, a period of time, there aren't new battleships that actually come online. Now, Arizona has a big facelift done in, in the early 1930s, but, you know, by 1941, she really is getting pretty long in, in the tooth. Her and her sisters, uh, at, at that point, there are nine battleships, uh, all about the same tonnage and about the same length assigned to the U.S. Pacific Fleet. Arizona is 600 uh, feet long, carries um, nine 14-inch guns, and it's 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 really a ship that it's it's not cutting edge anymore. We can talk about aircraft carriers and how they're kind of sneaking in in terms of importance, and of course, nothing's going to show the, the importance of aircraft carriers more than than what happens to the battleships on on December seventh. Something I read was that, that she was slower than the aircraft carriers quite considerably. Is that right? 
considerably slower. The aircraft carriers, in the roundest of terms, uh, have top speeds of about 35 knots. The battleships of these classes would, would only go along about, about 25 knots. And, you know, that's, that's a big difference if you're talking about the, the full, the full fleet. In fact, one of the reasons that the U.S. aircraft carriers are not in Pearl Harbor and the battleships are, on the morning of December 7th, is that there's three American aircraft carriers in the Pacific, the Saratogas on the West Coast undergoing repairs, and the other two are Enterprise and Lexington, and they've been sent to deliver aircraft reinforcements to the islands of Wake and Midway. Well, why didn't the battleships go with them? Well, the battleships didn't go with them because they were just far too slow. And even though there was some expectation that they might encounter counter, uh, not a big scale uh, Navy from the Japanese side, but certainly uh, snooping submarines or overflights of aircraft or things like that. The Navy, uh, Admiral Kimmel, really wanted to dispatch fast delivery ships, if you will, and and look to the aircraft carriers and and the battleships ended up uh, all being in port. It's funny because it struck me then it was almost the, the writings on the wall. What <laughs> what's the use of the battleship if it can't really help protect the 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 the, the, the carrier, which uh, which doesn't really have its own armament itself? I think there's still the mentality in, in the U.S. Navy, despite the fact that people like uh, Ernest J. King have already war gamed off Hawaii with aircraft carriers and a couple of times staged mock attacks against Pearl Harbor that that really are almost the same thing that, that the Japanese do a, a, a few years later. And I think there's still the mentality, despite those kind of exercises, that the, the U.S. fleet is going at some point to sail west with their battleships and counter the Japanese threat. Now, no one expects that threat is going to come as directly as it does to the Hawaiian Islands. I think the mentality is more, uh, again, the old saw about fighting the last war. And there, a lot of people are still thinking of Admiral Dewey in Manila Bay and, you know, they're going to go rescue the Philippines. The Japanese, of course, have been, been moving south and moving into China for a number of years prior to 1941. And I think the U.S. Navy is still of the mentality that the fleet is going to to go en masse, sail west across the Pacific, and there's going to be this climatic battle uh, uh, between battleships. It's funny because th- you say fighting the last war because that that was exactly the thought that we, what was going to happen by the British in the last in the First World War. Yet nobody could quite get round to being brave enough to bring the ships out because sinking the fleet would have been a war loser. Exactly. And so you get this, <laughs> you get this thing where no, they dance around for the First World War without really ever fighting the big battle that they were always anticipating would uh, would win the war. <laughs> um, so th- you mentioned that there's. Eight of the ship, eight of the battleships at, at Pearl Harbor. Um, that is does seem a lot to be all in at the same time. Was is that normal? Well, what happened? They were divided into divisions, and they had three battleships per division. And normally, what was happening is that one, maybe two divisions, that's to say three or six battleships, would be in port at the same time, but the other division would always be deployed elsewhere. Now, it was highly unusual that on the morning of December 7th, there were eight battleships there. The one a battleship that misses this is the battleship Colorado, which is undergoing a major overhaul in Bremerton. It's sort of the ninth ship of the three divisions there. So in the days leading up to this, there's been a lot of submarine activity off the Hawaiian Islands, Japanese submarine activity. And I think uh, uh, two things probably account for the fact that maybe those ships, battleships are all together on, on December 7th. One, I think Admiral Kimmel is a, a bit scared about submarines and about anchoring the ships. There's an anchorage called Lahaina Roads off Maui where sometimes the, the battleships and part of the fleet would, would anchor. I think he really judged that Pearl Harbor was much safer putting them all there from potential Japanese submarine attacks. The second piece of that, why I think there probably were eight battleships there at one time, is back to what we just talked about, about the mentality that Kimmel might be called upon to sail west. Now, 
again, in, in the biggest picture, back let's back up just a second or two and remind folks that Japan's really been at war in China since 1937. Japan has been moving south throughout 1940 and 1941 into Indochina as France suffers defeats in, in Europe and, and sort of gives up control there. And Japan's interested in, in the natural resources of, of the East Indies. So in early December uh, 1941, the um, U.S. is really expecting, and Great Britain is as well, some kind of attack south, perhaps against the British at Singapore, perhaps against the Americans uh, in, in the Philippines. I think that there's probably an expectation on Kimmel's part that he might be called upon to sail the fleet en masse, all of the battleships westward, and counter that. So I think those are, are two reasons why there were very unusually, eight battleships in Pearl Harbor that morning. By the way, one of those, the Pennsylvania, which is Kimmel's flagship, is sitting in uh, dry dock, having uh, propellers changed out. With that many uh, ships in there, was, there's a lot of crews uh, docked. What's what's it, what's life like for for crews when they're docked at, at Pearl Harbor? Are they at uh, liberty to uh, go ashore and have a good time, or is it all battle stations? No, everyone was at liberty there. They had different, uh, different times and things and, and certainly liberty was looked forward to. U.S. Navy had regulations that unless you were really a bad guy and did something wrong, or it's kind of interesting in the manual, it says the health of the port discouraged it. Uh, <laughs> you can take that a number of different ways, but unless th th those things occurred, then every 14 days, you were due some form of, of liberty. Now, usually that meant going in on, on the crew boat uh, of an afternoon. You'd salute the officer of the deck. You'd go down uh, the gangway to the crew back boat. It would take you across uh, Pearl Harbor waters and uh, let you off at the fleet landing site there. And then, and then you'd go into usually Honolulu. There was also a, a, a place there that was kind of a big recreation center block arena, uh, right there in Pearl Harbor Navy base proper. But you know, I, I think what I found from, from the men that I looked at that the glamour and excitement that some people might think about, Oh, Honolulu. Wow. You know, that's, that's great. Let's go in and tear up the town. You know, a lot of these guys just prefer to stay on the ship, save up their money. I, th I think we got to remember that these are 18, 19, 20-year-old kids that, I, that I've written about in Brothers Down that are sending, you know, they're making $30, $35 a month. And many of them are sending $10 a month of that home, having it automatically withdrawn and sent home. Because in the lingering days of the Great Depression, they're trying to put food on the table by sending money and, and helping out what are typically usually pretty big families. So yeah, you went into Honolulu, you blew off steam, had a few beers, took in a movie, you know, maybe, maybe you went down and, and, uh, did the whorehouse routine if, if you were apt to do that. But I, I think a lot of that wore off pretty, pretty quickly. And we can talk about the reasons why the U.S. fleet was in Pearl Harbor to begin with, because all of these ships had traditionally been based in West Coast ports. And that really only changed in the fall of 1940 when President Roosevelt decided to station the fleet against a lot of objections in Pearl Harbor as opposed to their West Coast ports. Well, that brings me to something that had surprised me was, uh, was that so many, I say families, wives uh, uh, had followed the fleet ac across because I hadn't quite realised that, I guess, because it, it's mainly, it is, it's, it is, you know, an American territory, but you somehow I didn't think why, you know, I always kind of think that the, those main ports in the US would, would be the, uh, where the wives were. But there's quite a few seem to have followed the men over. So when they're at liberty, they kind of have a home life to go to, which surprised me. And some of those who survived, who were brothers, indeed did survive because they not only had liberty ashore, but they had privileges to stay with a wife who had what was usually a pretty small uh, ramshackle apartment in, in Honolulu. Now, you know, the background to that, 
is that many families and young wives located in West Coast ports, uh, Long Beach is where the Arizona was was home ported for a long time, just so they could be there when the ship was in port and, and see their loved ones. Now, after the fleet was deployed to Pearl Harbor in the spring of, of 1940, a few of the wives, and some of them were more more recent newlyweds, some had, had been married a little bit longer, uh, on their own, uh, and the Navy really discouraged this, but nonetheless, you know, young love uh, went ahead and booked passage and got things that they could do in Honolulu. A- among the families I'm remembering, uh, one was a nurse, one worked as a clerk in the Navy office. So again, enlisted men, you had to be in a while and have one of the higher ratings to really have the economic wherewithal, even if a wife was in Honolulu working with you, to kind of e- eke out a- an existence off off ship. And of course, a-, a few of the brothers who were older, who had this arrangement and had wives there, you know, their, their younger brothers, uh, were, were on the battleship and we can talk about a couple of families who, who an older brother lost two younger brothers just, just because, uh, you know, they were the, the younger crewmen who, who were in fact, uh, stationed on the ship and didn't have liberty privileges in, in Honolulu. So if, if we look at that ship's complement and I've completely failed to make a note of it, it's about 1500, isn't it, on the ship? Is that? About, it's about 1500 and you know that went up and down a little bit it's amazing to look at the muster rolls and see how much change there would be new people coming on people being transferred off but um it's it's roughly a little bit more than than 1500 that's correct of that there's 37 pairs or trios on the USS Arizona that seems like a lot was that common to have so many siblings together on one ship that is a lot it was common to have brothers serving together and you know i i think the reason why is that you know again it's you got to remember it's it's the depression and these guys have signed up in the late 30s 1940, you know, not out of any great patriotic pride, although there was some of that. Um, but, you know, they, they really needed the money. They needed a steady job. A, a few of these brothers have worked with Civilian Conservation Corps, uh, CCC. Many of them are from rural backgrounds and families coming, coming off the farm. They've signed up because because they really needed the money. Well, there's that funny thing. Uh, Nimitz, I think Nimitz is from Midwest, the American Midwest, isn't it? it I, yes, Texas. You know, I always think that the Navy's full of people from the coast, and I, I'm led to believe that the American Navy uh, is actually made up from from people who are not near the coast at all. Well, it's amazing that uh, that a number of of these brothers, and, and you're right, there were actually 38 sets of brothers. And I think the Arizona had a a much higher rate than normal. But I guess, I guess where I was going before with with that answer was was that the Navy really encouraged younger brothers to sign up and accommodated them because they wanted to serve with their their big brother. Going home in one's uniform well, and to 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 younger siblings who really needed. A job and, you know, are kind of thinking, wow, how am I going to get off the family farm? What am I going to do? It was a great re- recruiting poster. And, you know, then after basic training, they say as, as apprentice seaman, well, I want to serve with my older brother. And there's such a need for, for those kind of entry level positions, if you will, that, that sure, they, they get assigned to the same ship. Now, from what I've been able to find, the numbers of brothers on the Arizona was certainly much greater just by happenstance. There are actually five brothers serving together on the adjacent battleship Nevada that's moored that morning just behind the, the Arizona. So it, it was, was certainly something that happened, but, but it's, it's kind of a staggering number that 38 sets in, as, as you say, uh, a couple of trios making for 78 men. And then, of course, there's a father and son on, on the ship as well. So on the night of the 6th of December, what's the mood like on the Arizona? Presumably they're not prepared f- 
directly for war? They're not prepared directly for war, but but I guess I would say two things. One, you know, it it's was interesting to me through looking at at letters and and diaries and just the whole feel uh in that October and November of of 1941 that I think that most of the people in the fleet these enlisted ranks expected something to happen. They knew that war was going to break out. There's a letter from from one of the brothers home to his girlfriend saying, you know, we both know there's going to be a war sometime. Next time I'm home on leave, let's not waste a second of it, etc. I think at one point he was hoping he'd get back home and and propose to this particular woman. But I think that the point is is that everyone expected something to happen. They expected they were going to sail west and be engaged in some conflict. Clearly, they didn't expect the tragedy that was going to come out of the skies in, in that horrific morning. But they expected something to happen. And even in terms of the bigger picture, Franklin Roosevelt and his cabinet, as late as Friday afternoon, December 5th, at that cabinet meeting, Roosevelt takes a little poll and basically says, okay, if the Japanese move south and attack the British at Singapore, what are we going to do? Are we going to go ahead and come to the support of the Brits? And the general uh, consensus, and, and it's not really, he's not really asking for a firm vote or anything, but the general consensus is that, is that yeah, that would, that would probably trigger something. Certainly that's in, in FDR's mind. So again, I, I think there's an expectation through the latter half of 1941 that something pretty major is going to happen in the Pacific. No one expects it to come with a fury that it did against Pearl Harbor that Sunday morning. That fatalism must have been reinforced on that night when the Washington, in Washington, the day to set the Japanese cable to their embassy that's right isn't it for their ambassador to deliver the next day at the time of the attack is that at at a very at a very specific time uh shortly before the attack was to actually after the planes had lifted off from their uh carriers but before they actually attacked pearl harbor and you know it it was a 14 part message and the 14th part and the execution message with which basically said deliver this to the the secretary of state very unusual that the specific time very unusual on on a sunday and, you know, that really got George Marshall and his counterpart in the Navy, Harold Stark, uh, chief of naval operations, fired up. And, of course, Marshall sends off his, his famous, you know, we don't know what this means exactly, but the Japanese are delivering what we take to be an ultimatum at um, w- 1 p.m. and, you know, be on the lookout ac- accordingly. Well, of course, the Japanese were late in making the delivery of that message because they're, they're doing hunt and peck typing and they have to decipher those messages. And of course, the U.S. has broken the Japanese code. So they're already doing, they already know what the Japanese are going to say in terms of taking a real hard line against negotiations. But they, again, they don't anticipate the fury that's that's going to be directed at Pearl Harbor. So I didn't realize that the opening shots of Pearl Harbor are not fired by the Japanese. Well, if if you're talking about the submarine and the ward, yes, ex- ex- exactly. And you know, the the short story is is the ward spies uh, a Japanese submarine trying to follow a merchant vessel through the torpedo nets in into the inner harbor. They attack it. They they sink it. The captain of the ward is is very adamant. Hey, you know, uh, as he sends this message up the chain of command, you know, make sure this isn't any any just um, maybe, but this is somebody that we we definitely spotted. We 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 sank this submarine, and that message does work its way up the chain of command at at Pearl Harbor. Kimmel gets it about ten minutes before the explosions start in the harbor. If we go to look at you know that 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 uh, that you know it takes clock isn't it hawaii standard time that this attack goes in what's happening you know as the as the japanese ambassador is you know preparing to deliver his communique what's happening on the uss uh, arizona as this first wave of uh, of japanese planes come in well it's sunday morning so typically things are are relatively laid back you know saturday morning is the big uh, spit and polish inspection uh, once that's out of the way, a lot of uh, the sailors head into Honolulu. 
but but Sunday morning, uh, you know, the the people who are ashore, even some of the bachelor uh, officers, are staying in bachelor officers' quarters on Ford Island. Uh, they're not on the ship, but they're basically real close, uh, Fort Island right there ad adjacent to where the Arizona's moored. And, of course, most famously, the, the band, uh, the Navy band that's on the ship, assembles on the fantail about to play the national anthem. Part of the story uh, is not only about the Navy, but it's about Marines in, in this book. Two of the, the, the brothers' sets, one was in the Navy and one was on the, in the Marines. The Marines uh, in those days had what was called a Marine detachment that was assigned to larger ships, typically aircraft carriers and, and battleships. And they did a variety of things. But one of the things that they did do is they were the honor guard that basically took care of raising the colors. So about five minutes to eight on that morning, we've got the band assembled on the fantail there. And we also have the Marine color guard ready to raise the national uh, ensign. Was there a protocol for the ships in the case of a sudden attack such as this? When they're in, a, in, in Pearl Harbor, I mean, how, how quick did the Arizona react? The, the sad thing is that, yes, there was a protocol, but there would have only been two secondary guns, uh, essentially anti-aircraft guns, manned on, on either and, and ready on either side of the ship, one on, one on each side. And somewhat strangely enough, Part of the problem became that even though there were sort of duty guns, if you will, manned and relatively ready, there was only a limited amount of ammunition available at each of these guns. So after it really became clear that this was not a training exercise, you know, a lot of the guys hear these planes and look up and, you know, there's explosions off on, on Fort Island. What, what really happens is that the first few Japanese planes are dive bombers and they attack the airfield uh, on Fort Island and they also attack the airfield at, at Hickam. And then come the torpedo bombers from both sides. And of course, there's Japanese Zeros, the fighters flashing around. And there's a number of reports, including from the brothers that I write about, who are basically looking up and, and seeing uh, the big red ball, uh, meatball of uh, a Japanese emblem and saying, whoa, wow, what's going on? And even some of the more seasoned officers, uh, Sam Fuqua on the um, Arizona and basically looks up and thinks that, well, this has got to be just some one stray Japanese plane launched from a submarine or, or whatever. And of course, within a really, really short period of time, it becomes clear that there's an awful lot more more planes. What happens to the Arizona? What 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 hits her? It's hit pretty pretty quickly, isn't it? On this opening wave, Japanese torpedo planes come at battleship row from from both sides. There are um, torpedo planes that come in from the west and sort of are tr mistake an old battleship that's been used as a target ship called the Utah and a couple of cruisers on the west side of Fort Island. So they release torpedoes against them. But the main Japanese torpedo planes come down a place called the Southeast Lock. And it's almost, I write, like a gun sight that basically if you come right down that lock, you, you, you burst over the main harbor and right ahead of you there is this row of, of, of battleships. Well, those torpedo planes released first and particularly the battleships that were outlying the Oklahoma, the West Virginia and, and the California are, are hit by torpedoes. Now, the battleships, at least six of them, are, are kind of uh, put in pairs. So there's an inbound close to the island ship, and then there's an outbound battleship. And the outbound battleships are hit by torpedoes. The Arizona happens to be moored inbound. Its partner on the outside, on the harbor side, is not a battleship, but a repair ship called the Vestal. There was some work going to be done. Part of a radar housing was due to be installed on Arizona. You know, those kind of things. And the Vestal was a repair ship. Think of it as kind of a floating hardware store. And anything you needed, you got. Uh, and they were moored alongside. 
So the point is, is that the Vestal being there really protects the Arizona from some, some of these early torpedo attacks. What happens literally within a minute or two is that there's a next wave of Japanese bombers that are not coming in low carrying torpedoes, but they're flying about 10,000 feet up and they're dropping armored piercing shells. And there's a, a flight of five bombers that, that drop some and those explosions hit around the Arizona. One glances off the rear turret number four, a couple of hit the Vestal. And so far, I mean, that's damage, but that's, that's not huge. What really makes it huge and, and cataclysmic in terms of, of really just a matter of seconds is that a second flight of five bombers drops these armor piercing shells and one of them goes through the deck near the number two turret and goes down three decks and basically ends up starting fires that ignite the entire powder magazine. I, I forget exactly, but there's something like a, a million pounds of gunpowder. It's, it's a huge amount. And there is this huge, huge explosion that literally destroys the forward two thirds of the ship. There's eyewitness accounts from people in the harbor and on other ships around that, uh, you know, one guy uh, wrote that, you know, it's like the Arizona just rose up out of the water and shook like a dog and, it, you know, then settled back down on itself. And as it did, the decks collapsed one after another. And, you know, most tragically, anyone who was below decks in the forward two thirds of the ship was killed almost instantly. And of course, any of that were on above the main deck on the forward two thirds of the ship had, had a similar fate. The damage control officer, Lieutenant Commander Sam uh, Fuqua, wins the Medal of Honor for his action, actions. What's he doing on the stricken ship to win the Medal of Honor? Well, he's the one that really tries to pull things together. I mean, he's eating breakfast when the the first bombs hit. He stumbles up to the quarter deck. He's basically knocked unconscious for for a minute or two by that first explosion in in the bomb that hits the turret number 4. And after that, you know, he he gets up, tries to tries to rally some measure of defense very quickly realizes that, uh, you know, what he's got to do is a recovery uh, exercise to try to get as many of his men off the ship as, as possible. And, you know, those, those numbers of people who are actually on the ship are, are, are pretty low. And out of the 78 brothers who are assigned there, now, some of them are indeed the older brothers who have been lucky enough to be with their wives in Honolulu. But out of those 78 brothers, 63 perish. Well, it struck me as being a high ratio of fatalities. I wondered if brothers were risking their lives to find their kin or if, there was, or if it was just luck of the draw. One of the, the brothers uh, that I write about, the, the, the team of brothers, are, are the Christiansons from, from Kansas, Buddy and Sonny Christensen. Buddy and Sonny were on deck that morning, basically dressed in their whites, ready to go into Honolulu on Liberty. And Buddy basically noticed a, a, some kind of black mark on Sonny's hat. And, you know, that wasn't going to pass muster with the officer of the deck. So Sonny disappears down below and says, wait a second, you know, I got to get a new hat. I'll be right back. Well, of course, he goes down uh, below decks and Buddy never sees him again. Buddy ends up running to his battle station, which is in turret number four. And it's a long, gruesome story, but he at least survives. But, you know, in, in that blink of time, here are two brothers ready to go to basically Honolulu. They were going to take photographs of themselves in uniform because Buddy had just shown up on on the ship just reported uh, a month or two before and they were going to take christmas photographs for their mom in in their uniform and in a blink of an eye you know sunny sunny's gone and um, uh, buddy survives for those men uh who'd spent the evening 
or spent the evening, spent the night on shore uh, who had siblings on board. Was there any chance of them getting onto, onto the Arizona to search or was it just, you know, too catastrophic? They, well, they definitely tried. There, there are stories of, of older brothers. Uh, Thomas Mur- Murdoch is one. He's got two brothers. The Murdochs are one of the, the two sets of trios. He's got two brothers, uh, on, on the ship and he wakes up in Honolulu and, and tries to, to get back to the ship. He's got a story of, you know, commandeering a car and some army lieutenant who's driving says to, uh, him and his buddy, well, you know, I can only take one of you. And of course, both of them jump in and, and, you know, they've got a load of cars headed, headed toward the, the naval base. They get strafed along the way by a Japanese zero. Uh, and yet they, they make it to, uh, the shore there at the fleet landing. And, you know, they look out across the harbor and it's really, really clear that there's just this mass of, 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 flame and smoke that's engulfed the Arizona. And of course, as well, the other battleships along the row. But by and large, in, in the photographs and testimony certainly uh, bears this out, that the, the most horrific explosion was indeed the Arizona. And, and that's the big major plume that, that was visible across the harbor. And if you came to the water's edge and had a brother on the ship, especially um, like the uh, the older Becker brother who who had two uh, siblings there as well and knew where their battle stations were in turret number two down below ready to load the guns and of course the guns the big 14 inch guns weren't going to be able to do anything against these kind of aerial attacks but nonetheless when battle stations uh, general quarters sounded uh, you know the crew attempted to get there before this horrific explosion you know somebody somebody like that Harvey Becker just just knew that Marvin and Wesley in all likelihood had been together but had not made it what happened to the Vestal? That's tied up besides the Arizona. I mean, it's uh, amazing this footage of the Arizona explosion. I mean, it, it is an enormous explosion. What happens to the Vestal? Well, the the Vestal at one point, uh, there's some confusion there. The the bomb blasts pour, uh, put the um, captain uh, into the water at one point. And yes, in fact, the executive officer, sort of not knowing 100% what's going on, orders uh, the the abandonment of of the ship. And then the captain claws his way back on, onto the vessel and says, no, absolutely no way. You're not abandoning the ship on me. You know, we're, we're going to take her out of here. And they end up cutting the lines to the Arizona and getting underway and pulling away, even though they've sustained uh, bomb hits. And of course, there's, there's, there's a great story. One of the survivors, there's five living survivors still who were on the Arizona, uh, that day. One of those survivors, Don Stratton, tells the story in, in his book about going hand over hand on a line from the Arizona to the, to the Vestal. And, and basically five guys got off the Arizona that way. And then Vestal does go ahead and cut the lines and, and pull away and has to, to run itself aground instead of, uh, to avoid sinking, run itself aground on the other side of, of the harbor. Amazing story, and the vest, uh, and I believe the Vestal survives through the whole of the war, and is pretty active through the whole war. I, I looked her up because I thought it was just an amazing story. The captain being uh, blown off again. There's all these connections. There is um, a younger brother by the name of Mike Givanazzo, who's a seaman on the Arizona. His older brother Joe is a more senior enlisted man on the Vestal. So there are two brothers, you know, on two different ships, and Joe Giovanazzo ends up serving on the Vestal after it's been patched up and it goes around the Pacific, as as you say. And I think it's the the Saratoga that it has a role in patching up after some of the 1942 battles. On the Arizona, where is Admiral Kidd and uh, Captain? Is it? Uh... Valkenberg, Van Valkenberg, do they have the opportunity to uh, order the abandoned ship or does no order need to abandon ship need to be given? The Admiral is on there. Admiral Kidd is on there as sort of the uh, the commander of that battleship division. 
So he's in charge of all three uh, battleships that are, that are in uh, the Arizona's division. Captain Van Valkenburg is, in fact, the the guy who would say abandon ship if he was able. But both of those two gentlemen rush to their positions. Um, Admiral Kidd on his uh, signal bridge, uh, Admiral Van Valkenburg on on the navigation bridge, and th- th- they get there very very quickly. And there's there's some talk from one of the officers junior there that, well, Admiral, you better get into this protected area. And no, Admiral Kidd wants to be out and see what's going on. So both of these, both of these officers who also, by the way, win the Medal of Honor, uh, both of these officers are killed almost instantaneously as that bomb drops through and explodes the, the powder magazine. It's probably, um, I should have been able to get an exact figure on this, but it's three to four minutes from the time that the general quarters alarm sounds and men start rushing to their battle stations. And the captain and the admiral, in fact, do go to theirs. Kind of somewhat unusual that maybe both were on board on Sunday morning, but they were, until the bomb goes through the forward deck and and, and makes this massive explosion. So that's why the lieutenant commander you referenced, Sam Fuka, who's the damage control officer, he sort of ends up being the the next in command who is on the ship at, at that point. And he's the one who finally at the end... One of there's a quote in the book about one of the enlisted men who basically says, you, you know, Commander, there's no use fighting it anymore, and it it was really clear that the the ship was settling. You know, it didn't in terms of sinking just because of this horrific damage in the forward two thirds of the ship, and it comes up in the air and then back down on itself with the decks collapsing, like like I mentioned, uh, it really just settles into the harbor there and and collapses up, upon itself. Now. How long does it take um, for the news to filter back uh, of the uh, disaster? Uh, well, at Pearl Harbor, and I was going to say the Arizona as well to the uh, to the USA. Well, you know the the entire attack, and it's it's Kimmel who basically sends a message out saying, "Air raid Pearl Harbor. This is no drill." And it's going back to Harold Stark, who's the chief of naval operations in Washington. It's also going out to, to, to ships at sea. And Admiral Bill Halsey at that point is on the Enterprise and he's just delivered some planes, one of those delivery vehicles we mentioned, uh, out to Wake Island. And, you know, staff officer comes in and says, you know, Admiral, there, there's a message here. There's a, there's an uh, air attack on, on Pearl Harbor. Well, Halsey, in typical fashion of carrier operations, he's going to return to to Pearl Harbor, supposedly, uh, a little bit later that day. They've already flown off a squadron of uh, fighters headed toward Pearl Harbor. And Halsey immediately thinks, oh, my God, you know, they're firing at my boys. They're shooting at, 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 at friendly planes. Well, of course, it ended up they were doing that. They were also shooting at a, at a, at a flight of uh, B-17s that had, a, had a, arrived almost at the same time as the Japanese attack trying to, trying to land. But, of course, it's, it's soon made real clear to Halsey, and it's also made real clear to uh, the folks in, in, in Washington that, no, this is, this is not a drill. This is the absolute thing. And, and of course, Frank Knox, who's the Secretary of, of the Navy, who is with Stark when that message comes in, says, well, this can't be right. This mean, must mean the Philippines. And Stark says, no, it's definitely Pearl Harbor. I mean, here's Kimmel's address right there. And Knox is the one that needs to pick up the um, phone and call the White House and tell Franklin Roosevelt. So for those families uh, who lost men on the Arizona, how long did it take the Navy to basically piece together what they have and notify the families of the loss? I, I, I'm guessing, you know, as an adjunct to that, is the confusion with so many siblings on there. You don't really want to be making mistakes. No, you don't want to be making mistakes. And unfortunately, in in the case of uh, Mike Giovanazzo, there was a mistake. You know, at one point he was reported missing, and then oh, he's safe. And then, unfortunately, the tragic uh, third telegram comes and says, 
hey, we messed up, you know, the, the Giovinazzo reported safe was in fact Joe who'd been on the Vestal and not Mike. Out of that crew of 1,500 or so that we talked about, there are 1,177 casualties on the Arizona itself. And it took an excruciating amount of time to get notices back to the families. And that's not because they didn't try. In fact, there was a postcard system that basically uh, allowed survivors to check a couple of boxes. They didn't want lengthy letters because that would involve censorship, but they were trying to expedite as quickly as possible. You check boxes that, uh, hey, I'm okay. A letter follows or I'm in the hospital, but I'm, I'm doing okay. I'm, I'm, I'm fine. And this, of course, wasn't just on the Arizona. This was throughout the naval base at Pearl Harbor. So those kind of postcards went out. In the case of the Murdoch brothers, where Thomas Murdoch has survived because he's been ashore, you know, he waits as long as possible, tries to get on the ship. You know, it's, it's really clear within a couple of days that there, there aren't any survivors. You know, he makes a phone call back to uh, his folks in, in Alabama. And there are various ways of Western Union telegrams and, and other things, usually starting with a missing in action report and then followed up at some point, and sometimes it took weeks, with the Secretary of the Navy regrets to to inform you. A couple of things that, that really struck me in doing the, this research is the family members and you know usually second and third generation removed from from these guys really still feel this event very personally even though they had they did not know personally the the family members who were killed because they you know they haven't been born yet or they were much much too too young they still feel it very very personally and almost without exception the stories that I found and the letters and everything, the inclination is to reach out right away and try to get in touch. And of course, in, in that day and age, it was, it was really letters, but there's, there's a woman in, in Colorado who had two sons, the Morse brothers who were on the Arizona. The very first thing that Clara Morse does uh, as, as she learns of the attack on, on that evening of December 7th is to write letters to both of her boys saying, I hope you're okay. And of course, most tragically, those letters go off. But about three weeks later, they're returned to her marked unclaimed. And, and for men such as Thomas Murdoch, with he's lost two brothers. He's ordered back onto the Arizona a few days later, isn't he? To, what are they, police body parts and personal effects and, and that kind of thing? And Murdoch's role as a chief yeoman was to basically assemble the muster role, uh, the final muster role of the Arizona. And again, we've talked about how thin the economics were, how little these guys were making. Some of them were trying to support a young wife or send money home to folks. So that muster role is important to try to make sure that the survivors are going to continue to get paid that there's some accountability for the missing and, and, uh, killed. And then also the few and very, very few who are the survivors, uh, a little bit over 300 out of that crew, although not all of those were on the ship that morning, but those survivors were then assigned to other battleships or, or other stations throughout the fleet. I made a note that there's two thirds of, of the, of the 300 and I think, I think I got it, 377 survivors. Two thirds were not on the Arizona, which is a reflection on how catastrophic that explosion is. Basically, you had very little chance of survival. Absolutely, which then only means whatever the number is, it was it was not mu many more than a hundred who actually sur were on the ship who in indeed did survive, and by and large, those folks were toward the stern of the ship. Some of them, in, 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 including uh, Buddy Christensen, were assigned to turret number four, and turret number four being inside the turret had, had really it shielded them from that main blast. Of course, then 
things go dark, they lose the power, noxious, noxious gases start to um, build up. It's totally dark. They got to they got to get their way out of the turret. Once they stumble out on deck, oh, they got a little bit of fresh air. But there's there's burning. There's oil stench. There's there's still Japanese fighters buzzing around and strafing them and everything else. So there's not necessarily any guarantee of survival. But being toward the stern of the ship, you had more of a fighting chance. A couple of these guys who survive actually get blown into the water by various explosions. And water by that point, you know, it's, it's really more like oil, burning oil on top of, of, of the water. Some, again, horrific stories of people trying to swim through that goo and either get to Fort Island, which was only about 50 yards away, or get picked up by some of the, the smaller ships that immediately started to circle both from from the stern of the Arizona and other surrounding battleships that tried to pick up survivors. I wonder if the lo- if the loss of so many siblings caused the US Navy to change their policy. Well, you know that's that's interesting. Bill Ball is one of the the brothers, he and his uh, brother who are aboard the ship and he's from Iowa and back home in Iowa the five famous Sullivan brothers decide that they're going to join up and avenge Bill Ball's death. And they do join up, all five of them, with the stipulation that they want to serve together. This attack and these casualties doesn't seem to have had any impact at all, either on brothers asking to serve together or the Navy prohibiting it. Well, the Sullivan brothers rather famously end up on the cruiser Juno. Cruiser Juno is torpedoed and sunk off Guadalcanal in November of 1942. And a lot of people in the general public think, oh yeah, the Sullivan brothers, the Navy outlawed siblings serving together. That never really happened. The Navy sent out some directives discouraging it. They said, you know, we're not going to honor requests uh, to serve together. But if you had, in fact, already been serving together, then there was there was no affirmative action taken to go and say, OK, we're dividing you guys up. You know, we're signing that that never happened throughout the war. Late in the war, by 1944, much much like the Army did, you think of the, the movie Saving Private Ryan and everything, the Navy did a similar thing in terms of sole survivor policy. But this was still pretty narrowly applied. If you were the last surviving son of a family and were serving in a combat area, you had the ability to say, hey, I request stateside duty or at least duty in some non-combatant area. But it, again, had to be that sailor had to say that. And by that time in the war, a lot of folks who'd been together with shipmates and been through all of this and were thinking that they were avenging their brother's deaths and everything else just didn't take advantage of that. So the long and the short of it is is that brothers continue to, to serve together aboard Navy ships. Did anyone ever take responsibility on the American side for, I don't know, I don't know if, if you could class them as failures, but... For instance, so many battleships in one place. Was anyone sacrificed, as it were? Well, the sacrificial lamb, of course, uh, on on the Navy side is is indeed Admiral Kimmel. And on the Army side, it's it's, uh, the Army General Walter Short. Even to this day, there are relatives of Kimmel and other supporters of Kimmel who think he got... Uh, a raw deal that there should have been better intelligence, more timely intelligence out of out of Washington, but it it, it certainly turned out that that he Kimmel uh, was was the one as the, the commander in the field who who ultimately was assigned at least the responsibility. He certainly had the responsibility. Whether he had a full measure of culpability is is the issue that continues to be delay, debated. Now, finally, the Arizona remains at Pearl Harbor. It was never it was never salvaged, which I found slightly surprising. It was never salvaged because it was so horrifically destroyed. Interestingly enough, even the battleship Oklahoma, which rolled over and entombed hundreds of sailors, it was it was righted and and salvaged as were a number of the other battleships and and quite frankly you know even even though there'd been this destruction most of those battleships see action again and they don't necessarily 
undertake the big battleship to battleship encounter that they were built for, but they basically do a lot of heavy bombardment off of islands and, and those, those kind of, of campaigns. The Arizona was so, two things, so tremendously destroyed and basically had become a graveyard for 1177 men. And the decision was left to, to, to keep it in place. The decision was made to keep it in place. And, of course, there's a memorial that was built over it in the ni- early 1960s. Very, very reverent place and, and very emotional for those who take the boat ride from the, the east side of the harbor out to the memorial. All of the names are, are etched on the wall of those who lost their lives. And... In more recent years, sitting anchored near the Arizona, under, un, which of course is under mostly underwater, uh, is the battleship Missouri. Battleship Missouri, upon which the the Japanese surrender was received by Douglas MacArthur, and you kind of think that's 1945. And again, to the the really first point, that's pretty a pretty short period of time for a weapon. The Missouri and her Iowa class sisters is sort of the epitome of a battleship strength. But all of that's happened since we talked about the Spanish American War in, in, in literally a, a half century. Battleships sort of ran their course. Well, that seems like a good place to finish. Thank you, Walter. The book Brothers Down by Walter Bowman is available now. I'll put a link on the website. It's a very interesting read. Next time, we should be looking at D-Day. In fact, it's D-Day month for the podcast. For the 75th anniversary, I have an episode looking at the American landings and then another at the British and Canadian beaches. I'm still working on slipping in an extra episode, but I will keep you posted on that. That's all for now. I'm Angus Wallace, and thanks for listening.